most important subject in all the world is the subject of religion. Such subject challenges the wisest and worthiest attention of every rational human being. Well, does rugged old Carlyle remind us that religion is the determining factor of any and every civilization. In these days of much discussion of this all-important subject, it behooves us all to think clearly and then to cleave faithfully to the vital, central, supreme thing. Sometimes just one brief expression contains a volume of meaning. For example, that widely quoted expression of Lloyd George following the World War a little above 20 years ago, when he said to the House of Commons and to the English people, this sentence, it is to be Christ or chaos for the world. He states the case just as it is. It is to be Christ or chaos for this world. It may be that the temptation has come to us all, at least for a moment, at one time or another, to say that we will not follow Christ, to say that we will cast away the hope and the help which he graciously offers us. Very well, suppose for just a moment that you do cast away the hope and the help which Christ graciously proffers, then what? Then where? If not to Christ, then to whom? Every human being must do one of two things with Christ. You must accept him as your Savior or reject him. You must give your heart yes to his call, follow me, or no, I will not follow thee. Suppose you do reject Christ and the help which he offers, then where? Then what? Then to whom? Wise men and women are bound always to look at consequences. Suppose someone today, as you leave this hall, should meet you and uh, propose to you that you give up your daily work, your cherished plan, and then just stop with a mere proposal. In astonishment, you'd ask him, suppose I do give up my daily work, my cherished plans, then what? What comes in said thereof? Wise men and women are bound to look at consequences. When, therefore, unbelief in any form, and it has many forms, when unbelief in any form has failed you, whatever the form, it behooves you to question carefully that unbelief and say to it, If I follow thee, then what? Then where? Wise men and women are bound to look at consequences. It is easy to cavil, to criticize, to tear down. It is another thing to create and to construct and to build. When Jesus was here in the flesh long ago. For a season, great multitudes followed him, some for the loaves and fishes, some to be healed of their sicknesses, and some out of sheer curiosity. But under his searching, winnowing words about what really following him meant, the multitudes fell away. The crowds were thinned down and depleted. 
fewer and fewer followed him under his searching word. Until one day he turned to his twelve apostles who were still with him and put to them this surpassingly pathetic question. Will ye also go away? One can feel the heartache in it. You see how they're leaving me? How they're forsaking me? How they're failing to follow me? Will ye also go away? And one of them made answer. Simon, Peter, made answer. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. There's your question and mine. There's everybody's question. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. The question at once arises, why do people go away from Christ? That they do go away from him is painfully evident. They must be seen going, whichever we return our eyes. Some are our own loved ones under our own roof tree, but they're going away from Christ. Some are our cherished friends and neighbors and fellow workers in the battle of life. But they're going away from Christ. They're living as though this world were all, as though there was no vast beyond in which we'll be personal and conscious somewhere, even forever. They're living as though none of that was in their thought. Now the question for this, why do rational men and women ever go away from Christ? There are various answers. Here in the case of the context for our question, you will observe that they went away from Christ because they objected to his terms of discipleship, to his way of salvation. Christ came and comes, saying to them and to us, I'll be your savior if you'll give me the primacy in your life, in your loyalty, in your love. I must be given the preeminence. I must come first. I must come before father and mother. Oh, what dear names are these with which to conjure. I must come before wife or husband or child or brother or sister. I must come before one's own life. I must come first. Or you will not be my disciple. Now under those searching terms, they fell away many in his day and many now and would follow him and will follow him no further. But would you have his terms of discipleship changed? Frankly, an eternity-bound man as I know myself to be, in a few brief days at most and best, I'll be in the gravest of my body and somewhere in the vast beyond, conscious and personal as the Bible teaches, I wouldn't take my salvation on a Savior whose terms are any lower than these laid down here by Christ Jesus the Lord. I must be given the primacy. I must be given first place. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. They went away from Christ in his day and continue this day because they object to his high term of discipleship in his cause and kingdom. Still again, people go away from Christ through the subtle power of public opinion. The Bible speaks of it under this sentence, the fear of man bringeth a snare. All through life, the fear of man, the power of personal public opinion, works its mighty influence. All through social life, the fear of man plays again and again a most disastrous part. And in business life, and in political life, and in moral and religious life, the fear of man often plays the most deleterious and down-dragging and disastrous part. 
No man liveth to himself. This book of God reminds us. And no man dieth to himself. We are also reminded. Here comes in the mighty peril and power of influence. What can any rational man or woman mean who is willing to be careful, careless about your personal influence over others, careless for even one day or hour or minute? What can the parent mean whose child or children is being molded by the parent and the parent is thoughtless and godless and careless living without any regard to God's revealed will and to God's gracious plan for our needy humanity. What can the careless father mean? I sought to win a lovely boy, some 14 years of age, a while ago to Christ. Bright, bonny, lovely boy. And by and by, he met me squarely with the issue, I think I'll not yield to what you say. And I said, would you mind telling me why? And he said, I'm going to follow Daddy. I think he's the cleverest man in all the town. Great thing for a boy to think that about his father. And a father ought so to live that his boy will think that. Every father ought so to live that the son will think that. And every mother ought so to live that her daughter will believe mother is the fairest and finest woman that ever I saw or expect to see at all. So I said to the boy, you're not going to follow Christ because your father doesn't. Is that it? He said, well, yes, for sure, that is it. And I went my way, thinking upon the gravity of the issue involved. And I found that father. And I said to him, I want to talk with you about uh, your boy. And he said, isn't he a fine boy? I said, I think I never saw a finer. Oh, he said, now we're getting along well. That's what I think. That's what I think. And I said, I've come to ask your enlistment, your support, your vital influence in behalf of that boy. Why, he said, I'd die for my boy any day. What more could you ask of me? And I said, sir, I've come to ask that you live for him. That's what I've come to ask for, that you live for him. Your boy told me point blank a few hours ago that he was going to follow you. You were irreligious. You were ungodly. You do not go to church. You are irreligious. You are putting aside the things of the Bible and the calls and claims of Christ. And your boy, when I crowded him as to the why of his delay to turn to Christ, he hid behind you. I've come to ask you to live for it. And to pursue my story one minute further, he said, well, that's the hardest blow I've ever had. I said, indeed it is. Jesus said, it were better for a man than a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he with that millstone were cast into the depths of the sea, than that he should cause one little somebody anywhere to stumble and go down to ruin. Oh, what can the careless father or mother mean when behind such life is a boy or girl or several? What can the careless father mean? What can the careless citizen mean? No man has the moral or ethical right to occupy a position in the occupancy of which position he is influenced in example, silent to be sure, unspoken out in words and noises and great sounds, silent, which is the mightiest influence of all. No man or woman has the moral or ethical right to occupy a position in the occupancy of which position. Somebody will be diverted by your influence and example and carried the downward way. People go away from Christ because somebody else sets the example and leads the way for them, and they follow in their train. Still again, people go away from Christ through the raising of captious doubts and speculative questions concerning these great verities of the Christian faith. They put the question mark after these great matters. What if Christ were only a good man deceived in himself? What if the Bible be not the inspired word of God, divinely edited and accredited? What if there be no hereafter? What if the grave is the last stop? What if immortality, its doctrine, is simply a hope? A delusion, a snare. And with question marks, after these great verities, they go on careless, heedless, unthinking, 
and present there in the grave and in eternity. I wonder if I speak to some, some man or woman this noonday who is in the thraldom of doubt. Doubt about these great Christian verities. What shall I say to you? Probe your doubts to the very bottom and make those doubts give back to you clear, definite, positive, comforting answers. Or leave those doubts as you'd leave a house burning down uh, with its timbers falling upon your head. Or as you'd run from a den of serpents wriggling and hissing to get to you to sting you, sting you to your death. Somebody has well said that doubt is either the agony of an earnest soul or it is the superficial trifling of some unthinking fool. There are different kinds of doubt. There's the doubt of the head. Nathaniel had that thought. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, come and see. That's the right answer. Come and see. There's the doubt of the heart. The doubt which comes from sorrow. John the Baptist, when he was in prison, cribbed and confined there through the cruelty of Herod, he sent some of his men, did John, out yonder to ask Jesus, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And then there's the worst doubt of all, the doubt which comes from sin. Sin makes doubt, as does nothing else in the world. Sin blinds, and corrodes, and rusts, and perverts, and stains. Sin is a veil through which Christ cannot be seen. Sin is an insulator that cuts off the currents between Christ and us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, see him here and now, as well as see him when we get to the world beyond. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he it is that shall receive the blessing of the Lord. So let me hasten to say, whatever the form or occasion of your doubt, you shall have deliverance from it, certain and glorious, if you take the straight road marked out for you by Christ himself. And what is that straight road? Here it is. If any man, if any man willeth to do the will of God, he shall know of the teaching whether it be of God. If I knew I had my hall today half filled with scornful infidels and prating skeptics, I'd say, but wait, my brother man, you can find out the truth about this matter of the Christian faith, the Christian hope, the Christian religion. Here's Christ's great death, infallible. Here it is. If any man willeth to do the will of God, he shall know of the teaching, but it be of God. You let any man, though his doubts, rise higher than the mountains over his spirit, though his questions probe him like arrows on every side, you let any man come to Christ saying sincerely, I want to know the truth. If thou art God manifest in the flesh, if thou art a poor sinner savior, I want to know the truth. And if thou wilt in thine own way reveal it to me, I'll walk in that way, so help me God. Any infidel or unbeliever in the world will be brought into the light. I've seen the proof of it made times without count. I would stake my eternal salvation on this. I am staking my eternal salvation on Christ, who says you give your all to me and I'll take care of you and the rest. Still again, people go away from Christ through the theory that they'll somehow save themselves. Oh, you'll not, my man, you'll not, dear woman, save yourself. Your ladder is entirely too short. It doesn't get any higher than your head, yet it doesn't get any higher than your heart, for out of the heart are the issues of life. If you could save yourself, then we would have never heard that heartbreaking cry of Jesus in Gethsemane. If you could save yourself, we would have never seen that incomparable sight on lonely Golgotha when the victim on that cross died praying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Oh, no. You can't save yourself. We never would have heard of Gethsemane and Calvary. Never in the world if human beings could save themselves. 
No man cometh unto the Father, saith Jesus, but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. One mediator have we between God and ourselves. One mediator, and that mediator is Christ, our advocate, our atoning sin-bearer, our redeeming Savior. Why do people go away from Christ? Well, most of all, I think, they go away through the subtle power of procrastination. One thinks of the old Spanish proverb, namely, the road of by and by leads to the house of never. Satan's masterpiece of subtlety and strategy and cunning is to get the eternity-bound men and women when they think about religion and hear about it to say, well, not now, mañana, tomorrow, by and by, a little later, not now. This is Satan's masterpiece of subtlety and deceivableness whereby he would destroy the world. You haven't any time to lose. Some of us will be in our graves before another Christmas, and that isn't far away. And that somebody may be you. You haven't any time to lose to see about provision for your eternal peace and safety. But let me hurry on. I said wise men and women are bound to look at consequences, and they are. They're bound to see the outcome of things, the results of things. We are bound, if we be wise, to look down the road and see the final chapter to uh, life decisions and courses. If you go away from Christ, then where will you go for your ideal? What if all that Christ said and taught and did and was and is, what if all that were blotted from the universe this hour, fancy the moral and intellectual darkness that would enwrap the whole world, fancy that great sun up yonder in the material universe, blotted away, all the light and heat that we have now in this earth comes from that sun. Fancy yonder sun were all blotted out. Imagine, if you can, the awful condition of this planet. Fancy Christ, who said and uh, meant it and is, when he said it, I am the light of the world. Fancy Christ, all that he ever said, all that he ever originated, his personality, the sum total of his whole great being, fancy, all that Christ and pertaining to him were blotted out. Where would we be morally and spiritually? Where would you go for your ideals? Where would you go for your standards if Christ were gone? If you go away from Christ, then at the same time you leave the Bible. For Christ and the Bible constitute the binomial word of God. If you reject Christ, you reject the Bible. No more quote the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. No more quote the great 14th chapter of John, let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you, uh, put it no more. If Christ uh, be taken away, if you reject him, what will you do with the friends that he has in the world who are talking about him and talking for him? As I am trying to do this noonday, what will you do with Christ's friends? And he's had millions. And he has millions today in the earth who are glad above all gladnesses to avow themselves as Christ's friends. What will you do with them if you reject Christ? Some of his friends have been great and mighty and powerful. Gladstone said he knew 60 of the greatest minds of his generation. Great scientists and statesmen, 60 he knew personally, and 54 of them were the devoutest friends of Jesus that he ever saw. Uh, just before... Governor Woodrow Wilson was nominated for the presidency. He made a visit to this city and spent a day. And the religious forces asked him if he would make a, an address to the religious forces, not political at all. And after a moment he said, yes, I'll speak on the Bible. And in the meeting house of the First Baptist Church, he spoke for one hour. The most classic tribute I ever heard or read in the world on the Bible. He said one thing that I can never forget. Not a political reference in his address, not one. But in that address on the Bible, he said, I wouldn't give up my personal hope in Christ for the whole material universe. What would you do the testimony of a man like that? Oh, you say he's too high, too far removed, too great. I couldn't approximate him very well. What will you do the mother boy you? 
and who went away as mine did, saying, I'm more conscious of Jesus' presence with me now than I'm conscious of your presence, my son, or of your father's presence, with whom I've accompanied for sixty long years. What will you do with testimony like that? Still again, if you go away from Christ, you're left baffled and broken in the presence of the three greatest mysteries of all. What are they? The mystery of sin, the mystery of sorrow, and the mystery of death. If you go away from Christ, what will you do about sin? Your sin. And mistake it not your sin. Your ruinous, enthralling, destructive sin. What will you do about it? Christ came to save sinners. And if you reject the sinner's Savior, then what and where? Still again, if you go away from Christ, what will you do about life's sorrows? They beat upon us, these Black Fridays, these terrible storms, these underminings, these overturnings. What will you do when the darkest day of all comes if you reject Christ, the healer of broken hearts? And if you go away, what will you do with that grim sarcasm down at the end of life, the name of which is death. What will you do with that if you reject Christ? Plato and Socrates, the wise man back yonder, wondered and speculated in the presence of death. And so did Caesar, the great soldier, in the Roman Senate as he stood beside the bier of the dead senator. Christ comes to us in the marketplace of life, telling us as we sicken and suffer and die, or as our loved ones slip away across that silent sea, you need to be afraid. Your trust is in me, and I'll turn the shadow of death into morning, and I'll make the grave a glorious gateway through which my friend shall pass into the land of life, where all the conditions of life are to be perfect forever. Oh, men and women, my dear, dear friends, men and women of Dallas, my dear, dear friends, give attention, I pray you, I adjure you, I would get down on my knees to beseech you if that would help. Give attention, I pray you, to Christ's call, for it's too late. There can be no substitute for Christ. You may go and get everything else the world has. There can be no substitute for Christ. There can be no substitutes for Christ. He is the Savior who can give sweetest pleasures while we live. He is the Savior must supply solid comfort when we die. After death, his joys will be lasting as eternity. There's one more couplet. Can you say it? Won't you say it? Here it is. Be that living Christ, my friend, then my joys will never end. Does your heart say yes? I want him for my friend. Be that living Christ, my friend, then my joys will never end. Does your heart say yes? Stand to your feet. Add thy blessing, O thou gracious Savior, add thy blessing. Make thy truth vitally personal, intensely individual. Give these busy, burdened, battling men and women as they find their many places of work and service. Give them one by one to face the question until their heart can say with Thomas about Jesus, my Lord and my God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all to abide with you today and tomorrow and beyond forevermore. Amen.